Hello, everyone, and welcome to this WeCreate EDU Hangout. I am delighted to be here with Peter today. Peter hey, knows lots of things, so we're going to pick his brain, and we're going to learn about online education, how to be better researchers, why libraries are so awesome, and we're just going to chat about how to do better research, and um, you guys can give us your questions in the chat. We're going to be monitoring along the way. So do you want to explain some of the projects you're working on and the awesome degree that you're currently getting? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so right now, uh, my life is mainly absorbed with one major project, and that is I'm creating, and this is a thing that I've been doing, like anyone who knows me is like, oh yeah, I know Peter, you, you're doing this all the time. Um, I am creating a taxonomy uh, or a set of rules with which we can classify uh, YouTube educational videos in the hopes of either getting YouTube to implement this taxonomy on YouTube itself, uh, or I'll just go and make my own platform. Um, so yeah, it ended up being something like, I wrapped it up today, it was 38 pages, and then I will go and put, um, I'm gonna use it as a directed study. I'm gonna use a directed study next term to like build it up and develop it and get feedback from professionals. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the big thing. Uh, and then, oh, and then my degree. Yeah, so uh, I'm doing my master's in library and information studies up at University of British Columbia, beautiful British Columbia, uh, where, yeah, I'm studying library and information studies. Uh, I'm up here because it's one of the only information schools that I could find that actually has, that actually set new media as a research focus, um, which has been really great. I have an advisor, uh, I guess kind of like mentor, uh, named Eric Myers, Professor Eric Myers, who did a bunch of research not so long ago on the comment section of Khan Academy, uh, in fact, to see how people use the comment section to engage or be under the impression that they're engaging uh, with video creators and things like that, um, and the language that they use and what that actually means in the big scheme of you know learning online. Um, and so yeah, that's uh, that's what I've been doing. I've been doing a lot of uh, studying on interface design and document design, um, user experience, things like that. Um, things that are some of the more traditional, um, I guess, fields in uh, information studies more than library studies, uh, which is in itself a whole another discussion. So yeah. And you have two different YouTube channels, correct? I do, yeah. So the old one that everyone knows me for is Go Verba Noun, where I did my interviews with all of the educational folks on YouTube. So like Hank Green and Lindsay Doe and uh, Mike Rignetta and Joe Hansen. Um, and yeah, that's Go Verba Noun, go check it out. And then this past summer, I decided that as a way to kind of like re review what I'm studying in grad school, uh, I started another channel called Stacks and Facts, which talks about all of those big topics uh, in library and information studies. Uh, so information ethics, user experience, uh, taxonomy, which I just did a video about Buffy, uh, and whether or not Buffy and Giles would use the Dewey Decimal System to fight evil. You should go check it out. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So chat, you can let us know if you have research questions. Um, do you have overarching tips for people that are trying to do some research for YouTube? For sure. Uh, so, um, so let's say that you want to become a better researcher more generally, and also for YouTube specifically. Um, the first thing I can recommend, and this comes from my working for several years as an intelligence analyst, is read the news. Read the news all the time. Uh, my daily routine involves getting up, showering, brushing my teeth, going to the bathroom, uh, and then I go onto my computer and I go to news.google.com. Um, and Google has this really cool thing where it's basically a news aggregator where you set the topics that you want to read the news about, uh, and then it brings you uh, news articles from a variety of sources. Um, and you can actually specify which sources you like and which sources you don't. Um, so for mine, that privileges information science, uh, world affairs, current affairs, uh, science, technology. And I just spend like a half hour reading through headlines, um, clicking on articles that I think are interesting uh, and reading through them. Um, and this is an important, very important part of the research process because what it does is it gives you a base level of understanding of what's going on. Uh, if you're making a YouTube video, it helps you have an idea of like, oh, what's, 
what's hot right now? What are people talking about? What might people want to know more about? Um, and it also starts to give you a sense of like sources that you can rely on to go back to uh, find other information. Um, so my first tip for everyone when researching is read the news. Um, let's see, my second tip is research hard. No. Um, so a thing that a lot of people maybe don't know about is that Google allows the use of syntax when searching. Um, Google has a special set of syntax. So for example, uh, let's say that a while ago you read a news article on CNN or something, or maybe it was like a standard or something, but you know the website, but you don't remember exactly what the article was called and you're not sure how to find it. Um, if you go to Google, you can type site colon, and I'll put this in the chat window. So site cn.com, for example, and then the term you're searching. So potatoes. Um, and what that does is that will search CNN for the term potatoes. It won't search anywhere else on the internet, only CNN. Um, that's a really good way to find things that you've seen before or search uh, sources that you know are fairly reliable uh, or are fairly relevant to the topic that you're researching. Um, some other useful syntax, and syntax is like the secret to everything. Um, some other useful syntax is using the word not. So you can say, I want to search potatoes, but I don't want to search famine. So you can type potatoes and then not, and then famine. Um, and that'll bring you back only results that are talking about potatoes that have nothing to do with famine. And I don't remember if Google syntax uses that, but they have um, an advanced search that you can use to specify that. Um, but syntax like that is really useful on big databases. So for example, uh, WorldCat or University Library Collections uh, or Google Scholar, things like that. Um, yeah. So those are a couple things. And then you had a, a really great idea at the We Create EDU workshop. Um, you wanted Google to actually, kind of like they have the music library, you want them to have kind of a, a library of research and documentation. But oh, yeah. Before that happens, what are some good places people can go that are free that they could get some papers and publications, and how could libraries help out? For sure. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Well played. Um, so one of the, there are a few places that you can go to find articles um, or just general resources all over. The first thing I would want to say is go to worldcat.org. Uh, Worldcat is a, it's like a meta database. It is a database of all of the collections of libraries around the world and it'll tell you what they have. Um, so it's a good way to search multiple libraries at once. But let's say that you're like, oh man, I'm researching this thing. I'm researching the potato famine. Man, me and potatoes. Uh, and you're like, I can't find any papers because I don't go to university and I'm not in We Create EDU, so I can't tell Peter to surreptitiously acquire me that paper. Um, what do you do? Well, one thing that you can do is you can go to your local library and see if they offer journal access. Um, because it happens, it just so happens that a lot of public libraries nowadays, um, they fork out the money for journal subscriptions uh, for their for their people, so folks in their community. Uh, and usually all you need to access that is a library card um, with a PIN number. Um, so you would go, and you don't have, have to go to the library to do that, as long as you have the card already. You just go to like www.jackieslibrary.org, uh, and they'll have a little thing that says search um, search articles, and you just pop your credentials in, and boom, you're good, you're golden. And then you can start searching uh, academic journals uh, with reckless abandon. Um, yeah, so I think it would be really great if, uh, say, I don't know, YouTube provided something like that for creators um, as one of those perks to get folks to make better educational content. Um, yeah. And that way you could cite things and then people could actually see the source documents if they want to go a little bit further than whatever you're doing too. So that yeah. would be nice. Yeah, and that was actually an idea that came from my interview with Mike Rignetta uh, back in 2014 is when I was uh, visiting with him in New York, because this was back when PBS Idea Channel, God rest its soul, uh, was still a thing. Uh, Mike was talking about how he often cited papers 
on PBS ID channel, but he couldn't actually provide the articles to his viewers. Um, and so he was like, gee, it sure would be nice if, say, you know, YouTube forked out a little bit of cash so that we could look at these things. Um, or even if it was just our subscribers uh, or anything like that. Because at the moment, it's one of those things where it's like, well, uh, I say that this isn't a paper, uh, but as is the way with things as of late, just because somebody says something is somewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Um, so, yeah. As the chat agrees, they also wish we had an edutainment por portal that we could use. They also really like your uh, webcam. And yeah, I, I just saw that. Uh, so Betty, my webcam is, it's a Logitech something or other. It's a 1080 HD, blah, blah, blah. And then my headphones are also Logitech because we're in loyalty. Um, but they're, vi they're very nice. I use, I use them uh, when I worked at a call center. I'll, I'll shoot you the specs later. <laughs> It is a very nice webcam. Thank you. <laughs> um, something what you're saying with the libraries and getting publications and stuff. I also mm -hmm. didn't know that. I thought you'd have to like physically go there to get like magazines or books. Mm -hmm. I found out like a year or two ago that you can just digitally go on there. So if you're science or psychology or whatever, they have a lot of like nature and those kind of magazines that you can subscribe to. So yeah. people in the chat that said they didn't want to know you know, all the U.S. politic news, you could maybe do something more along those lines, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, and also, to speak to Betty's uh, mention about the U.S. politic news, another thing you can do with Google News to avoid all of that is, so Betty and I share this common bond insofar as we both live in Canada, uh, and also Kathy, who's in the chat. Hey, Kathy. Um, and Google being what it is, it localizes all of the search results. And so the only reason I see stuff going on in the US is because I'm an American. Um, and so my Google account is going to be forever linked to the US. Um, but if you're Canadian, you'll read a lot about like, oops, uh, Justin Trudeau, or uh, what's his face? All of the conservatives who are doing crazy things. Um, so yeah, it really depends on where you're from. And again, you can customize it. Like if you're like, ah, I really don't want to see things from Fox News, you just tell Google, ah, don't show me any more of this. And it'll get filtered out, which is really nice. That's a great point the uh, chat has. Uh, you can get audiobooks and ebooks too from mm -hmm. libraries very easily and get them instantly. And you can often request books if they don't have them. Um, and maybe they'll get them for you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so if you're looking for like leisure reading or even like actual research reading, um, there's this system called the interlibrary loan. Um, and like you mentioned, sometimes it can take a little while, but if you go to your library and like, hey, I'm trying to get a copy of this, they can probably find it for you uh, and they can probably get it to you in like a week or two, assuming that there's a library somewhere in the country that has it and it's not checked out. Um, that country being the US. I think it's similar, there's similar function up here in Canada. Um, but yeah, I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's the same. And the chat says they think they're mostly Canadians. <laughs> yeah, no, I just realized that. Uh, poor neurotransmissions. Uh, oh, hey, neurotransmissions, which one of you is it, or is it both of you? You can answer that later. Do you have any um, like just librarian tricks for going and finding the information that you need? Hmm, librarian tricks for finding. Okay, well, so there's a couple. First of all, um, here's a thing that a lot of people don't necessarily think about. So as edge YouTubers, as YouTube EDU folks, we know the value of research and we know the value of like going to Google Scholar and getting access to research that already exists. Because oftentimes Google Scholar does a really good job at presenting us um, with research that we need. Um, because a lot of it is free, but not all of it. Um, and also, while Google Scholar is great, it's basically just a Google for research. Um, so my advice as a librarian in training is to um, find your local university or use my university's website, uh, library.ubc.ca, uh, and use that search article, or that, that search engine. Um, and take some time to learn how to use syntax. Uh, I love that word so much, syntax, because it makes my life so easy. 
Um, you know, understanding that if you put things in quotes, you search for only a phrase. And if you put the word not, you exclude other phrases. Um, you know, those are the two most commonly used things. Um, so yeah, you can go to like a library, a university library's website and search for articles. And then after you find them, uh, each article has, almost each article has what's called a DOI or a digital object identifier. It's kind of like a URL for research articles so that you can find them forever and ever. Um, and you take that DOI and you can go to Google Scholar and plug that DOI in and that piece of research will come up. Um, so that way you can use like the access to the, not really the access, but you can use the search functionality of a university library to find what you're looking for and then go find it on the internet at large uh, at your research acquisition location of place, whether that's in Canada or in the Ukraine or wherever. They do say that Canada does have this um, interlibrary loan system too. Excellent. Definitely at least at um, universities, so. Uh, yeah, nice, nice. So at least applicable to North America. Mm -hmm. All you Europeans watching this tomorrow morning, I don't know. Oh man, so uh, speaking of libraries and Europe for a second, uh, so I didn't realize, like, so in the States, we always talk about like how rough libraries have it because they've been closing down. Um, but in the UK, it's even worse. Um, libraries, public libraries have been getting shut down all the time. Uh, and they're switching over from like librarian run libraries or like city run libraries to volunteer run libraries. Um, and while it's valuable and good that people are taking that mantle, um, a lot of folks don't understand what exactly librarians do. And so when you take a librarian out of a library, what that means is you take out somebody with a breadth of experience uh, in research and in learning their community's needs and like learning like how you know some people in the community might use one source of information while another might use another source of information um, when you take librarians out of libraries you lose uh, programming development so developing say events uh, or reading initiatives um, or even food drives for communities or like uh, you lose folks who know how to interface with the community and interface with community partners uh, to help make their communities big and blossom and pretty. Uh, and so that's kind of a little bit of bad news um, on the library side. And it's been happening a little bit here in the US as well, uh, which is ridiculous because last year, um, I want to say the IFLC, which is the something Federation of Libraries and something, it's the big US agency that does library statistics, um, they found out that uh, library usage is actually going up over the past few years. Um, and the largest increase has been seen in folks that are 18 to 35. Um, so libraries are getting a lot more popular with young people. Uh, and likely that's because young people are poor uh, and we like to save a buck when we can. So there's that. Um, oh, there was another thing that I missed before I went off on my tangent, but it's fine. Yeah, libraries are definitely uh, good community centers. Um, that's where we do a lot of our STEM outreach because it's harder to get in schools. Schools have mm -hmm. a lot more red tape. So mm -hmm. we would just do community events in libraries. They're always looking for programming. Um, so we would help them out. And then Delaware library system is freaking fantastic. They have... Yeah. Filming equipment for you, thats a, I guess that's a thing that relates to us YouTubers. If mm -hmm. there was filming equipment or if you wanted to learn some of that, I know the libraries in Delaware have that. They have green screens and cameras and all kinds of stuff. And they have maker rooms now yeah. too, like 3D printers and stuff. So it's not, it's not always just books either. There's so much more than libraries. For sure. And I, I remembered uh, the thing that I wanted to say. So I saw Avon had mentioned that she had found a thing in a public library that she couldn't find at her university library. Uh, and I wanted to just be like, yes. Um, because, so fun fact, uh, 12 Tone, the guys over at 12 Tone, uh, occasionally they'll send me a request that like, they'll be like, hey, Peter, uh, you're a librarian. Can you find this stuff for us? Um, and like occasionally I do. Um, and usually it's like sheet music, which like our university has some of. Um, but Vancouver Public Library, first of all, it's amazing just generally. Um, it's seven stories of awesome and it's shaped like the Coliseum. 
Um, but also they have really good musical holdings. And so um, one of the guys at 12 Tone sent me a message like, hey, Peter, can you get us this? And like, I had some free time. So I went over to the library and I got the sheet music for them. And they're like, this is amazing. Um, so it goes to show, go to the library. You're going to be surprised. Um, and then as far as like maker spaces and things like that in public libraries, absolutely. Um, again, VPL, Vancouver Public Library, is amazing. Uh, they have, what is it, four recording studios? Fully equipped recording studios with soundboards, um, editing computer with the software that you need, um, green screens, lighting, all that jazz. Um, and then they have like 12 computers that are higher end for actual editing of video, things like that. Um, and they, like libraries, are able to do that kind of stuff. Um, at least in Vancouver, it's because of a combination of private donors and public money. Um, and then Missoula Public Library, that is to say Missoula home of DFTBA folks, uh, just got a ballot initiative passed last year. And so they are moving out of an old hospital uh, into a building that's being built specifically for them. Uh, and it's going to be five stories, and they're doing some really cool things. Uh, it's going to be a combination library, uh, community center, culture center. Um, and so it's going to have like theaters, it's going to have dedicated space for kids, um, just all kinds of stuff. So yeah, go check out your libraries and support them. And if you don't have a library card, this is me guilting you into getting a library card so that your library can then go to the people with money and be like, look, we're used. <laughs> and also, you get a lot of free stuff. Tons of free stuff. The chat's been saying things. And what are these chat people saying? Let's see. Oh, look, there's all kinds of people in here. We got like six folks. What's going on? Uh, TPL has access to scholarly journals. Hey, Kim. Uh, and newest productions also return the book when I'm done with it. Yes, that is nice. Uh, or you can keep it for a nominal fee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just got to meet Sid Mead, the visual designer from Blade Runner, uh, who's giving a talk at Pasadena Public Library. Nice. Nice. Oh, here's here's a piece of trivia for folks. Um, speaking of public libraries, so you remember Malik last year, or this like this year actually. Um, he and I were chatting because uh, we are both enthusiastic about libraries, um, and he's enthusiastic about libraries because he's on the board of directors for LA Public Library Makerspace. Um, cool dude, doing he's some also, pretty cool thing. He's also the head of uh, YouTube Learning and Education. For anyone that doesn't know who Malik is. Oh yeah, that that bears mentioning. He's the <laughs> global head of learning and all that jazz. Yeah, no, he's a cool dude. I uh, I actually emailed him shortly after VidCon because um, who was it talking about South by Southwest South by Southwest Edu? Uh, I want to do a panel proposal for Glams. Uh, Glams being galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Uh, and I wanted him to moderate it, but the timing didn't work out. But he was totally game. He's like, yeah, that sounds great, Peter. So I'll bug him at VidCon next year. Yep. Um, for anyone that didn't know, he was actually, he gave a little speech at our We Create EDU workshop last time. He's also the one that Peter was like, hey, you should make uh, research available to YouTubers. So maybe he'll be there again this year, and you guys get to meet him. Yeah. Um, what about museums? Can can museums help people do research? Yeah. Um, so I think the <sighs> museums are a little bit trickier. Um, so because the thing with museums, libraries typically are public institutions. That is to say they are paid for and funded by the communities in which they reside um, through things like levies and taxes uh, or like public bonds. With museums, it's a little bit different. Um, museums are typically funded by the public in forms of donations, um, but they usually, it, it's not a public institution in so far as it's paid with tax money. Um, and there's no real government involvement aside from grants. Um, and so with museums, uh, your mileage may vary, but my experience has been that museums are usually pretty on board with um, any kind of help that they can do that leads to like them getting publicity. Uh, so, I think the easiest example to think about is the Brain Scoop. 
Um, Field Museum sponsors and pays Emily Grassley a paycheck so that she can make YouTube videos. Um, the AMNH, which is the American Museum of Natural History, also has a wicked, wicked YouTube channel. Um, and all kinds of museums are starting to get on board with that as well. Uh, and so I think if there's a museum in your community and you're like, oh, they do really cool things, or I wonder if I can maybe film with them, it's the same with anyone else. Just shoot them an email. Just be like, hey, uh, you know, my name's so-and-so. My name's Kimberly from this channel called KHX Karataka, uh, and I do educational videos. And I was wondering if I could come and access some of your collections uh, so that I can help make people smart. Um, and they'll probably be like, yeah, totally, Kim, come on down. Um, because like generally the folks who work at museums are enthusiastic about it. Um, yeah. And they have to be because like when you work in a gallery or a library or an archive or a museum, it certainly isn't for the money. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times I think you have to, depending on how big the place is, you might have to go with their PR department or something like that. Mm -hmm. to get this clearances. Is true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, along those lines, I just emailed, and this is like a brand new thing that I'm announcing to everyone right now. Uh, I emailed the National Archives, uh, that is to say, the United States National Archives. Um, so like, capital T, V. Uh, uh, and I'm like, hey, y'all, I see you guys have a YouTube channel, and you actually use it. You want to be on a VidCon panel? Uh, and I heard back from them yesterday, today. Uh, and they were like, yes, we are so excited. We need to figure out the logistics. But yes, yes, we want to do this. Um, and so I'm going to put forth a panel proposal for Glams. And it's going to be called something like Glamorous, uh, the glamorous life of public institutions on YouTube. And I'm going to put like Fergie as the host or something. I think Fergie's saying that. Um, or myself, probably myself, because I think Fergie's probably busy. Um, Mainly so that I can like have Emily Grassley um, and Sarah Iris Green and National Archives and like um, New York Public Library or Colleen um, from UI Special Collections. Shout out to UI Special Collections uh, all on stage and ask them questions. So, yeah. Chat says been they've been nervous to do that. I think you mean nervous to email um, li or museums. Yeah, um, glams. But, yeah, Betty, farther up, Betty said that they have a lot of stuff at their their art museum, but it's hard for people to film there because of legal and copyright mm. reasons. But yeah. maybe if you can't film, maybe they still have, um, depending on the place, they might have a bunch of information you could use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. And they, it, well, like, so if... Um, Galleries might also have point of contact information for the artists themselves. Um, and if you reach out to the artists, you can probably be like, hey, I wanted to make a video talking about blah style of art. Uh, and I think that, like, it all comes down to schmoozing, right? Uh, and I think that your art is a great example of this. Uh, and I want to show it off to the world. And so I was wondering if I could feature it in this, because ultimately artists maintain um, creative rights over their works. Um, it might just take a little work convincing the galleries of that. Um, and then it gets a little bit trickier, I imagine, with things like, say, works of Van Gogh, although most of those are in pub the public domain. Um, but like folks who were alive but aren't anymore, but died recently enough to make it so that their works aren't in the public domain, but instead owned by an estate. Yeah, that's a little trickier. So. But some museums have like a brain scoop. Most of that is actually research. Like there's the front facing public, but then there's tons of research behind that. So you might be able to contact the original sources of stuff. Definitely, definitely, for sure. They like your panel idea. <laughs> Thanks y'all. <laughs> uh, I'm hopeful that it will uh, panel out. <laughs> And on the, when they were saying they were nervous to email people, do you want to go through, like, you've emailed a lot of people. I've emailed so many people. Uh. <laughs> and, like, your process for that. I mean, you started out a channel where you wanted to interview all the big education YouTubers, yeah. 
and you've emailed, you've gone to VidCon, you've made a lot of contacts, you've emailed like a lot of people from there too. Do you want to talk about kind of getting over that fear and actually going, trying to find the original sources and stuff? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so when you want to reach out, um, I guess we could call this like the process of how to do a collab of any sort. Um, usually you have that cold email. Um, and it's tricky because it really depends on who you're reaching out. I was a little bit luckier, I think, because back in 2014, like a lot of the folks who I interviewed, like they were already big, but they were like manageably big. Um, and so when I would email them, uh, you know, I could get away with having a little bit longer emails. Um, nowadays, it's like, well, you get like two or three lines um, for like really popular. So like if you're emailing Destin, for example, uh, well, if you are emailing Destin, you can probably put as much as you want because like you guys probably chat all the time. But like if I'm emailing Destin, uh, I'll want to be like, hey, Destin, my name's Peter. I research education stuff. Uh, and I was wondering, I'll be in, where is he like? Um, I'll be in Mississippi. Uh, could we get together for coffee and chat? Um, and like, you might want to include a line that like indicates that you're not just like emailing a bunch of people the same thing. So like, hey, Dustin, I really love Smarter Every Day and I think Prince Rupert Drops are the coolest thing ever. Can I interview you? Uh, or can we talk about these things? Um, and I feel good about emailing folks because I have this intrinsic belief that everyone wants to help save the world. Um, and so, like, I've never had someone reply back to me, be like, God damn it, Peter, don't email me. Like, everyone's like, oh, you want to help people too. What a coincidence. Sure, let's chat. Um, you know, it's just one of those mind your P's and Q's, keep things simple, and show that you know who they are um, and make it unique to them. Those are the three secrets. Um, but other than that, just and don't yeah. hound them. Yeah, don't hound them. <laughs> that is true. Um, yeah, like you're saying, Kimberly, what is the worst that could happen? Uh, the worst that could happen, yeah, they could say never contact you again. Um, but like that's like 10% likely. 90% they're going to be like, hey, thanks for contacting us. Um, we're super busy, uh, or hey, thanks for contacting us, we'd love to talk, or hey, talk to this person. Um, but you got to get the conversation started. And an email's good for that. I think I'm always like, what value am I going to bring to like whatever this is? But if you're doing researchy kind of things, I think it's easier than a collab because you're like, I love your research and more people should know about it. Yeah, yeah. There is, there is a certain advantage uh, for the research side because uh, when I contact people for research stuff, like usually it's because I think that they've done a really cool thing. Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm buttering them up, but you know, I'll definitely be like, wow, I just want to tell you how great I thought your paper was. Um, and I just want to pick your brain. Uh, because, you know, a lot of times people don't get that response and everyone likes to have their ego stroked in a good way. It's not a bad thing. Like, it's just like, People don't often get to talk about the things that they really care about. Um, so if you give them that opportunity, they're more likely to be agreeable. Hey, Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea. Hello. And, uh, hey, buddy. Peter. <laughs> Every time I see you, I think in my head, oh, hey, it's me, Peter. <laughs> Excellent. My plan has worked. <laughs> it has, because it's just so adorable. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? I'm well. Sorry, I'm a little late. I just got off work, I um, but I'm trying to catch up with the chats. Um, and I'm wondering if you've talked about your grad work at all yet, because I'm interested oh, I, to hear about that. I totally did, but we can do a recap for the did folks you? at home. No. Um, but before we do that, Jacqueline, you look like you had the thing you want to jump in with. Yeah, um, good call. But just on emails, Betty has the reverse questions. What do you do if someone is hounding you with emails? Ooh, having never been in that... Oh, that's not true. I have been in that position once. Um, well, I mean, honesty is the best policy. So be like, hey, you know, I'd love to help you out, but sorry, I just don't have the time. Um, as a grad student, I find that to be about as honest as I can be. Um, because, yeah, at the end of the day, I have very little time, uh, along with most people, even folks who aren't in grad school. And, like, Betty, uh, Little Miss, like, 
design whiz. I can't imagine your life is much less busy than mine is. Um, so yeah, just be like, hey, you know, I'm sorry, I'd love to chat, but I don't have the time. Or like, ooh, another good thing you can do is be like, put together everything in a simple document and shoot it to me. And when I get a chance, I'll look over it and get back to you. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, you only have so much time uh, and you got to commit to the things that you got to commit to before doing all that fun stuff. So. Yeah, too true. I was just set, writing up an email to send to somebody. So I'm glad to hear all of those tips as well. Nice. I'm like, oh, I actually am writing it okay. Yeah, and Betty, it's not being rude as long as you say sorry. <laughs> or you could even say, you know, sorry, I can't help you right now, but mm -hmm. if you want to email me back in a couple of months when I have more free time, then maybe I can get to it. Yeah, I think, like, so on the receiving end of someone who hounds people constantly, I would rather have an honest, I'm really busy right now and I can't help you versus the uh, echoing of crickets. Um, because then it's like, oh, did they get my email? Are they super busy? Are they purposefully ignoring me? And then like you start stressing out. Uh, whereas I'd just rather be like, eh, sorry, I can't. Because then at least I know I can refocus my effort somewhere else. That's a good call. Oh, to recap, I'm doing grad school in library and information studies. And I just finished a taxonomy. Uh, so a taxonomy being a set of standards that one uses to classify a collection of items. Uh, a taxonomy for educational YouTube videos. Um, it is 38 pages long. Uh, my eyes are still bleeding, but they're mostly done. I finished it earlier today. Uh, and it's called, Are You Not Edutained? from like Gladiator. Which is the best title ever. Right, all caps, no no punctuation. And on the last page, I put a picture of that little meme with the Gladiator and across the top it says, are you not? And the bottom it says, edutained. Because that's yeah. how we do in library school, y'all. <laughs> Memes. <laughs> so what's the biggest takeaway you have from your 38 page wonderfulness? So the thing about the taxonomy is um, and this is how like classifying things goes and this is how it like operates outside of the world of Google. Like when you develop a taxonomy, when you develop a classification system, you do it with an imagined user base. Uh, in my case, I had four people, four personae that I was developing this taxonomy for. The first one is teachers. That is to say folks who are responsible for educating others. Um, the next one is formal learners. That is to say folks who because of being in an institutional learning system need to find out information to make their lives better. Um, the next one is informal learners, which is like folks like you and me and like folks who browse YouTube for fun to find things that they wanna learn about. Uh, and then the last one is developers. Uh, so my taxonomy has a lot of um, implementation advice. So like how to automate certain things. Like I don't wanna talk about it in too much detail because like this is going to be a big project that I might someday make money off of. Um, but the idea is when you design, when you select metadata elements that are explicitly useful for these people, then these people are more likely to use it. Um, so like if I say, make it so that we look at one of ja Jacqueline's uh, videos uh, and we tag it not just with like engineering, but we make a specific tag for like engineering and robotics, but then specifically, it also applies to say these common core standards, a teacher would find that useful uh, because a teacher has to teach to the standards that they exist under. Um, another example is, um, so the idea of show me versus tell me versus guide me. Uh, so if you look at, I think educational videos, they almost all of them fall under one of those three categories. Um, to a varying degree. So either you have a video that's a show me, which is like, oh, let me illustrate a concept for you. So for example, Jacqueline builds a robot. That's show me. Um, tell me is more like if Jacqueline was telling us about the history of robotics uh, or how, you know, a weather balloon can capture the video of blah, but didn't actually show us the process of doing that. Uh, and then the guide me is like, 
when we think about makeup tutorials is a really easy example uh, or how to's or anything like that. Um, because I have this feeling and it bears more research that um, having like having an idea of what, what where that video falls for each of those categories categories would be useful to learners and teachers um, because it helps them make informed decisions as to whether or not this is a thing that is worth their time. Um, so that's one of the things that's in my taxonomy that I'm developing and like trying to figure out how to make that automated because at this point there's hundreds of thousands if not millions of hours of educational video out there already. Um, I can't just go and apply this metadata to all those videos myself um, and I can't crowdsource we create edu to do that on a wiki either no matter how much I would like to um, because it's not practical. Uh, so I've been looking at machine learning uh, and um, natural language processing uh, as a way to automate these classifications with, of course, human intervention where necessary and like doing quality control, things like that. Right. The, the chat has a question. Do you think yes. mixed show tell guide videos um, may be problematic? Thanks for asking. That's a great question. And the answer is no. Uh, so, uh, and there's a reason. So when I designed this, I realized that there are going to be a lot of videos where it's not explicitly one or the other. And so the way I address this is I set the element standard to be all three of them. So every video has a value for every one of those categories uh, from zero to 10. So for example, let's look at Crash Course. Crash Course is a great example because we have 760 videos to look at. Um, and they are all more or less the same format. You know, if you look at a Crash Course video, let's say you take a random 10 samplings of frames, 10 of them are going to have John or Hank or you know Mike or whoever is the presenter, their head right there, um, telling you about a thing. Um, and then like another 10 random frames is gonna be like, oh, uh, it's actually animations of things going around and the Mongols being the exception, all that jazz. So that would be like the show me. Um, guide me doesn't apply. Um, but if it did, you know, you could tell that like a portion of a video has to do with guide me because you know maybe when you look at the transcript it said the person says first you're gonna blah 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 and then you're gonna blah 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 uh, and then don't forget to you know be awesome or whatever um, you can look at the language and see like oh well it's giving commands therefore you know if X amount of the script deals with mm -hmm. giving commands or telling a person how to do a thing then we can assign it this value uh, somewhere between zero to ten uh, for each of those fields. So yeah, and then the way, the thing that makes that really tricky to implement, or not tricky to implement, but exciting to implement is building an interface around the taxonomy. Um, if somebody says they want videos that show me, uh, you can order it by just how showy it is. Um, so maybe there's a video that's like 100% just nothing but pictures of volcanoes and Mongols and things like that. Um, and then towards the bottom, there might be like, you know, a volcano giving a lecture on something. I don't know. The idea is like you can organize it according to how relevant it is to you, according to what you say is most relevant to you. So, so is it like a difference between like lean back and lean in content kind of like yeah. whether you're just going to receive information or whether you want to be more involved in whatever's happening? Exactly. Yeah. And when I was coming up with these elements as a thing, uh, as a as a part of this taxonomy, uh, like I did a lot of research, like I, I reviewed a lot of, I didn't do the research, but I reviewed a lot of research uh, that looked at how people learn um, and what has been effective. And there's a piece of research, I should just pull up my annotated bibliography uh, that discusses, you know, how the different method of teaching affects comprehension and affects grades and test scores and things like that. So where is it? It is... Uh, here it is. Okay, so the the article is called "Experiential versus Lecture-Based Learning." Does the choice of instructional method matter? Um, and it's basically talking about how they took this class. I think it was a psych class uh, dedicated specifically towards teachers. Um, and half of the class did a lot of hands-on stuff, and half of the class only did lecture. And unsurprisingly to me, but we need research to actually bear this to be true. And so that's why this paper exists. The folks who did the hands-on stuff learned a lot 
better. And this was reflected by their grades being higher on average than the students who didn't um, get to participate uh, or do hands-on stuff in class. Uh, and there was another one that was along those lines as well. So like, you know, it's not just, I think this is a good idea. Um, it's other people think it's a good idea. And so let's, let's try it and let's see what happens. I wonder if it matters, like if you blend the two together, like the chat asks, like if you're doing multiple ones, like if it's better to have like a lecture first and then do hands-on or if it's better like hands-on you figure it out and then we tell you, well, this is like why your results were right or wrong or whatever, like, like blend the things you're talking about together. Yeah, so, uh, and it just so happens that I know this already also because uh, when of I was course. picking folks who, yeah, of course, um, when I was picking folks back in 2014 to interview, one of the folks I wanted to talk to was Derek, um, Derek Mueller from Veritasium, um, because Derek has a very unique kick-ass background insofar as he did his PhD in physics education. Uh, and his thesis was all about how um, video can affect, like how video, what effects video has on the learning process. Um, and that's why like if you go to Veritasium and you watch the videos, some of the older videos, he doesn't do this anymore so much because I think people are like, Derek, you're a dick. Um, but what he would do is he would go to like public places and be like, hey, uh, why do you think this is the way it is? Like, why do you think, how do trees grow? Like, where does the material that goes into trees come from? And like he'd record like 12 people being like, oh, you know, they, they pull stuff from the ground and then they become bigger. And then he'd be like, you're wrong. In fact, they pull the carbon dioxide out of the air and then they separate the carbon and the oxygen and they use the carbon from the air to grow. Um, and so scientifically, that's sound. Like if you can demonstrate, if you can get people to express a belief and then express to them why it's wrong, then they'll learn. But the flip side to that is they may become uh, disinclined to learn from you in the future. Um, so yeah, things like that are relevant. And so like trying to figure out, you know, how do we, um, for like, for the video creators, I gesture towards this way because this is where the chat is. Uh, for folks who are creating educational videos, like, um, that's a great question. Like, how do you format your video such that it privileges or it enhances the learning experience for the learner? Um, that's outside of my expertise. I only care about how information is organized. Um, but if you want help researching that, I probably will be looking at that stuff uh, this upcoming term while I'm doing my directed studies to help make this taxonomy bigger and better and more useful. So. I find that a really interesting subject, actually, um, because I've been reading and have read some articles in the past about how video learning is or is not useful for children, um, and how, <clears throat> excuse me, there was an article that I have read probably about a year ago um, that posited that video learning in and of itself is not the most effective way to get your kids to learn, um, especially at a younger age they need to have some sort of human interaction while they're watching the video. Mm -hmm. So if you're giving your kid, you know, your the iPad to watch whatever it is, whether it be, you know, the Wiggles or SciShow Kids or whatever, right. they can get some of that information, but they don't internalize most of that information unless you are sitting there and also interacting with the video with them and talking to them about whatever subject matter they're learning and, you know, whatever it is, whether it be here, there's blue, red, yellow blocks if they're yeah. tiny, you know, or actually learning higher concepts if they're in elementary school. Um, mm -hmm. Video is great, but it's not as good as humans plus video. Yeah, and that's that uh, falls within the realm of human information interaction, which falls under the broader realm of information studies, which is my soon to be specialty. And I say soon to be, I mean in like a year. Um, we look at, and we being information scientists, look at how the medium affects uh, how information is received um, and how information is processed. Um, a lot of that falls into things like um, cognitive science as well. Um, but, you know, we might go and we might take iPads. In fact, we do this sometimes at our school is we have some folks who research 
um, for example, augmented reality. And so we'll take a bunch of iPads after they design their augmented reality app and we give it to undergrads because undergrads are lab rats of the modern age and we have <laughs> them walk around and like scan different things. Um, and then we have them come back and be like, how was that for you? Uh, and our experience and the experience of other researchers around the world in this field is that like people prefer technology because they find it to be more convenient uh, and they find it to be more intuitive. Um, but when you actually start checking for like measurables, like does it demonstrably improve their lives or does it demonstrably improve task completion, whatever that task completion is, the answer is usually no. Mm -hmm. um, like this also came out uh, comparing uh, information uptake from reading a book versus reading something on an electronic screen. Um, reading from a book, turns out, uh, gets people a lot more experience. But like, <sighs> the trouble with being in research and like in academia is I can't just make a statement. Um, I have to make a statement and then put an, an air asterisk after everything I say because mm -hmm. it might be the case that for some people, it's completely the same experience. Um, and it might be the case that maybe for some people it isn't the same experience, but that's because of confounding confounding reasons. You know, maybe the reason, maybe if a person had an electronic screen with no distractions on it, whatever, um, maybe they could read just fine. Maybe it's not the medium that a person is reading on, um, but the extenuating circumstances that exist around that medium. Um, and I am not surprised that it's the same with children. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. I think talking about books too, I just had a thought that um, I wonder if, because I know there's been research that when you're like taking a lecture class, mm -hmm. if you're typing the notes on your laptop, you don't remember the information as well as if you were longhand writing them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's the same with reading a book. If you have that tactile, I'm turning a page, you know, just those little physical cues, if that's a reason why people might gain more information that way. And if there is a way to manufacture that on like an iPad experience, is mm -hmm. there a way to manufacture that kind of touch sensation somehow so that you could get an equivalent kind of experience? Yeah, for sure. That is a great question. Um, and I think it bears more research. The chat has lots of questions. Okay, let's let's go through <laughs> some of these questions. I'll let you read them off and I'll just answer them. So I put one in our little mini chat. I think that was the first thing that, um, first comment we got back when we were talking about um, changing somebody's opinion. They said, and the drawbacks to that effect if people commit a viewer understanding them becomes invested and then reject, they reject contrary information or they can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's talking about the idea of the echo chamber, um, or like becoming siloed um, in your own communities, where we are more inclined to believe people who agree with us, uh, and by doing so, we end up filtering out folks who disagree with us, um, and then you know it just it becomes a feedback loop of having less and less exposure to folks and differing opinions, which is one of those reasons where like as much as I would love to, I actually keep Fox News in my news briefing um, mm -hmm. because I that's how I know how other people who aren't me think. And Socratica says, so we need to tell the parents to watch Socratica kids with us? Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, no, 100%. Uh, and that also goes for things like story time. Like the idea behind story time isn't to get kids to read, it's to get parents to engage with their children while they read. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of reasons behind that. First of all, it gets, and this is like the library science side. I don't get to talk about this often, this is exciting. Um, it, gets, it gets kids to obviously do the reading, which is a very important life skill. Um, although, again, asterisk because like Waldorf schools don't actually teach reading as a skill until like third or fourth grade. Um, um, and then the other side of it though is like when you spend time with your kids, like a lot of that tends to be tactile. Yeah, uh, and kids need to have that tactile experience at a very young age to develop properly. Uh, and there is tons, tons of research uh, that shows that children who are touch starved when they are growing up like suffer really, really 
um, bad effects throughout the rest of their lives. So yeah, I encourage parents to watch Socratica with their kids um, and then have them engage with it afterwards. Be like, oh, what did you think of blah, blah, blah? Uh, what was your favorite blah, 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 you know? And then uh, they say my, the chat says, watch my seven-year-old watch videos is interesting. He watches informational videos, then wanders off and does stuff based on the video, creates maps, graph, languages, and then shows it to us. And then he goes back to the videos, rewatches them, returns to his made up world to do more creations and then tells us all about them. Rinse and repeat. That's awesome. That's yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Your kid is super cool. Right. <laughs> Which also reminds me of uh, it was a TED talk this guy did twice, like they the the computer in the wall. Have you heard about that one? Oh, just, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Leaves it, and then the kids learn on their own. And then they said the best version of that was they kind of learn on their own, but that if they had a grandma that was yep. like watching them and encouraging them, so they would make virtual grandmas that would mm -hmm. kind of talk to groups of kids and help them learn and work through it. And that was they found to be the best way for kids to learn. I yeah, that, I'm gonna have to watch that. It's so it's tricky. Um, and this goes to the, so when we're talking about information and technology, uh, there's a field of study, um, basically it's called socio-technical perspectives, where we don't look at just technology and we don't look at just people, but we look at how both affect each other. Um, and it's, it's a subset of critical theory. Uh, so critical theory being basically like Adam ruins everything, but for everything. Um, and the idea is that things are not always what they seem. So like we have this great TED talk and I remember watching that and being like, this is the best thing. Like that was one of the things that got me to come here uh, to grad school to study like how technology can help enhance education, TBH. Um, but like when you start thinking about how things work out, like it's important under like, the one laptop per child phenomenon, for example. So if you haven't heard of that, the idea was that there was going to be some venture capitalists somewhere who made a bunch of really cheap, really robust laptops and then just dropped them in the third world. And the idea is that kids of their own volition would take these laptops, open them up and learn and become like perfect little <laughs> superhumans to their own communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not what happened. Um, and that's because not quite the world how it is not a perfectly happy place. Um, what you end up having happen is the one laptop per child laptops are a commodity. Um, and so they become acquired by the folks who want to have control of commodities. Uh, and these commodities then become things that you barter with. Mm -hmm. um, in other parts of the world, you drop a bunch of electronics in it. And their previous experience with electronics are, oh, this is a thing that I can burn uh, and melt down to get valuable elements from like gold and platinum uh, and rare earth minerals. This happens all the time uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. It, and that's actually where a lot of e-waste ends up is like, you know, people, <laughs> my old cell phone I have, it has a cracked screen. So I got a new cell phone. Um, up until a few years ago, if I went and recycled this, what would happen is, you know, a company would take it and they would ship it to somewhere else. Uh, and then that somewhere else place would just be a pile of electronics. And then the folks who lived in these countries where these piles developed, they would go through and find things and burn them. So like old, you can imagine like the old CRT monitors uh, and burn them so that they can get to the goods. Um, because they don't know that when you burn these things, it emits fumes that like, cause cancer and cause respiratory distress. All they know is I need to eat. Um, and I know that there's a thing in this thing that if I melt it, I can get to and sell. Yeah. Um, and so you can have a similar phenomenon like that with one laptop per child. And so like <laughs> the Adam ruins everything in me is like, oh man, I love the idea of having the computer in the wall. But then I like, I can't help but wonder like, would it work to scale? Um, the answer is not necessarily yes or no. It's just more kind of research like, needed. Yeah, super complex kind of problems where, in theory, it's a great idea, right? Yeah. In theory, it could be really effective. But when you scale it, it becomes hard to predict and hard to manage how people are actually going to use it on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
but grandmas are great if you could get an actual grandma or like as long as if you could get like that emotional investment between the community and the piece of technology then yeah i think it would probably be a lot more effective um yeah and nannies and nannies because <laughs> we get sleep that's why mm. <laughs> Um, in the chat, I've been asking them, by the way, what they think their content is. So they've mm -hmm. all tried to figure out which which the three or two or how however many of them oh. they do. Yeah. Uh, the like show tell guide mm -hmm. content. Um, Betty has a question. Yeah. Uh, I find it very difficult to find things like energy codes, fire codes, plumbing standards, safety codes for free. They usually cost hundreds of dollars. Could they be available in libraries? Uh, it's possible, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> actually, here's an interesting thing. Uh, and Kathy, you should know about this if you're still in the chat. Um, fire maps. I think it was Kathy who was telling me about these. Uh, fire maps. So, insurance companies produce maps of like high, medium, and low risk uh, fire areas, um, and they also provide a bunch of other information. Um, and then libraries buy these up and they provide access to them because otherwise it would cost stupid amounts of money, like thousands of dollars, just to have access to these maps. Um, but these maps are a really great way to determine how valuable stuff is in an area, in a geographic area. Um, and I think the same is for codes. Um, of course, I don't, <laughs> Canada is a very different environment from the US when it comes to regulatory processes. Um, so whereas in the States, we have OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is a big federal agency that you know covers federal regulations for the entire country. Um, in Canada, it's provincial level. So here in BC, we have WorkSafe BC, uh, and they're in charge of all of the, uh, the occupational safety and health stuff. Um, and in Canada, there's no overarching ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, or Canadians with Disabilities Act. It comes down to the province uh, to decide on things like that. So... Short answer is your mileage may vary, but the best way to find out is to go to your library website and put in code things. Maybe do a little research with your provincial safety organization and find out what it's called, and then go to the library website and try searching it and see if it comes up. And then ask. In the Toronto Public Library, they really have these, and or it's super outdated. Mm, this is true. This is true. For the outdated stuff, I got nothing. Uh, libraries. Well, actually, no, I don't have nothing. I have something. So if you tell the library that it's outdated and that you need a newer copy, they libraries do have a certain amount of discretionary funds that they can use to acquire new things. Um, and a thing like that would fall into professional development, which uh, usually ends up being a specialized collection. Uh, within the library. So in VPL, they have professional development collections that they keep um, behind glass. And so like you can take them and you can look at them, but you can't leave the library with them. Um, but that would be a thing to investigate and ask them like, hey, do you guys have these in your holdings? Um, because libraries also are charged with um, like helping small businesses develop. Uh, they tend to be a resource for that as well. And it was suggested that you go talk to the actual librarians. <laughs> yeah, and then definitely. Brian, yeah, she, she thinks she's going to do that. And then Brian asked, do libraries have the same FOIA privileges, access, privilege access to as journalists? Uh, I guess it depends on what you mean by FOIA privilege access. Um, so here's a piece of information about me that people didn't know. Uh, so y'all probably knew that I was an intelligence analyst for the Navy. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say this on video. Uh, you don't have to, don't worry. Don't, don't do anything. Oh no, I can, I can write it. Okay, and I worked with some intelligence agencies uh, who were charged with answering FOIA requests. And so I ended up, one of my collateral duties was um, reviewing things for um, declassification. And so I guess for FOIA requests, the way it works out is anyone can file a FOIA request. There's no exemption or anything like that. Um, as far as I know, that's special for libraries uh, 
or journalists. I think the only exception is that for journalists, typically journalists are affiliated with an organization that's larger. And I, the disclaimer, I could be totally wrong, um, but usually journalists are affiliated with an organization that's larger and has the time to commit uh, to pushing forward a FOIA. And for those who don't understand, um, FOIA is a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, and in Canada, it's very similar name. Uh, do journalists get it for free or cheap? So, yeah. Usually the costs that are associated with FOIA, I don't think libraries get that perk, um, but the costs with FOIA in the States are associated with the costs of copying. Uh, I just submitted a FOIA request the other day to the NSA to find out what they had on me. I don't know where it went, but because I worked with them, uh, the copies, oh, by the way, now you know, uh, the copies that I, <laughs> <laughs> the things that they sent me, they sent to me for free because it was related to me. And I think like there's a certain amount of goodwill, I guess, that they're just like, I'll cover it and I'll cover the shipping. Um, so instead of charging like the $27 to ship it express and private, they just like sent it to me with my name on it. Um, your mileage may vary. <laughs> Brian says they get streamlined and their cost reimbursed. I would believe that. Um, the reasons for that, for journalists anyways, is because it becomes a matter of, um, you don't want to look like you're hiding something, is the thing. So like if a journalist goes to print and says, you know, we, we asked the NSA for this information, but it's been like six weeks and they haven't gotten back to us. That looks really bad and that looks really suspicious. Um, so whereas the NSA might have a wait time for the average person for most FOIA requests to be six to eight weeks because they get so many because everybody wants to know what the NSA has on them. Um, and usually it's nothing. Um, you know, that gets kind of hairy when, you know, the New York Times says, yeah, no, we, we asked them for information, but they chose not to play nice. Yeah. But libraries, I don't imagine, have that kind of privilege. So, Government is just generally slow. So, <laughs> That's true. That's very true. It took me six months to get my, uh, my office chair. Sounds about right. <laughs> so good luck getting your papers. <laughs> and that <was> fast. <laughs> but I bet, it was a really, I bet it's a really nice ergonomically designed office chair, right? <laughs> yeah. And they knew Betty, what was coming, Betty so they ordered it way before I got there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very good. Very good. So, um, we're coming up on an hour. So, uh, any more chat questions? <laughs> Yay, office chairs. Any last question? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You're our very own Jack Ryan, Peter. I'm going to pretend that I know what that pop culture reference refers to and be like, ha, 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 sure I am. <laughs> I don't, Jack Ryan, I don't... the like, hero from the Tom Clancy novels? Oh, yeah. See, uh, books? I don't know what those are. I never read those. I don't know. <laughs> right over my head. Oh, neat. Kim worked at JPL. Awesome. You know, when you work in the government, you get a feel for like, oh, man. Small tangent, small rant, since we're in a lull in questions. Uh, so, like, as normal people, we exist and we're like, you know, sometimes we might see, like, a, a conspiracy theory and be like, oh, you know, well, I mean, maybe, maybe it's possible. I mean, you never know what, like, those government agencies actually do. But then you work for a government agency and you're like, are you kidding me? I would not trust the government to, like, be capable of completing something that complex with no one finding out. <laughs> like they're just not that organized. They're just they not that organized. <laughs> and people love talking. Like the guy who killed uh, Osama bin Laden and then published a book about it with all of those classified sort of details, like that's the reason that we know that we actually went to the moon. Because if we didn't, someone would have been like, oh yeah, no, I I like took these photos with my with my Kodak or whatever cameras they had back then of the stage. <laughs> Look, here it is. Although I guess back in the 60s, they killed people more. So maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? Well, 
they sure wasted a lot of money building a lot of structures they didn't need if that's true <laughs> right <laughs> right a lot of them still exist it's true <laughs> uh yeah let's see do you do you have any other um parting piece of research advice or any place we could go to besides oh, what was the one you said yeah i do the uh, world, world cat yeah. yeah i got a thing and i'll post in the chat because i feel very smug about it um so my goal is at some point i'm going to publish a video on stacks and facts talking about all of the advantages that public libraries have uh, to offer for youtube creators specifically like i actually have the script written um but because grad school being what it is i have not filmed it yet um and also i think it would be a really nice video to publish um oh the link doesn't work hmm. i made you a moderator so you could put links in but we can put it in the slack too i'll just i'll just tell you all it's petermusser.com <laughs> uh if you go to petermusser.com there's a link on the right that says youtube creators resource list uh that's going to do you just fine in terms of research advice and like how to take advantage of all of the free things that exist out there. Um, yeah, it's mostly up to date. I published it right after VidCon this year. Um, but then the other resource that exists uh, for folks is me. If you're in we create edu, send me private messages. Um, be like, hey, Peter, I'm trying to find information about this thing. Like a bunch of you already do it. Uh, and can either attest to the fact that like I give good information or super busy, um, but I'm pretty good at like getting back to people because I'm affiliated with the university <laughs> and my library access is free -E, and I have a funny sense of copyright law. La 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> was a beautiful song. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I applaud you for that. Thank you. I was very edutained. <laughs> very good. Well, we just passed an hour, so. Cool. Thank you so much for coming. No problem. Thanks um, for inviting me. This is always exciting. Uh, I'm excited to see what kind of submissions are going to happen for the pre-VidCon thing that you're planning. Yeah, we have a we have a couple of submissions so far for uh, panels. I think Betty, I think Betty submitted three or four or something like that. So thank you, Betty. Yeah, and whoever's watching, if you haven't submitted any, you know, ideas for panels, if you have anything you want to talk about um, and you're in the Slack, make sure you go check it out and submit your ideas. It's yeah, true. You can submit ideas for, if you have an idea for a panel, and panel is a very loose term. So yeah, right. if you want to have like a campfire, which is more like a discussion, like you want to bring up a certain topic, you don't have the answers, but you want to kind of moderate it with the group, you can do that. You can do meetups um, or Hopefully, we're trying to have a little corner with the collab corner, like with video equipment set up. So if you want to try and coordinate some collabs ahead of time, some people thought it would be cool to screen some of our videos um, in front of everybody. Like, we'll pick some to screen. Um, alliteratives thought we should have a script swap. Like, it's very open-ended. It's just not going to be like six people sitting in front of all the other people um, telling their information. So if you have an idea for a panel kind of thing, please submit it. And if you don't have an idea for a panel, but you want to learn a thing um, and you just want to submit a topic, you can do that. And then at some point when I figure out how to do this part, I do want to know who we want to invite outside of WeCreateEDU because mm. we're working with Josh and Complexly, I think, is going to join in and <laughs> PBS Digital. So um, we can get a bunch of people outside of we create edu and I would love smaller people too that you know like they don't have to be giant youtubers um, and most of us are sciencey and history so mm -hmm. if we can expand like who who we're contacting that would be great too to be more diverse so we're gonna try and get a list together of people we want to invite and then I'm gonna ask Josh if we have enough room for everybody <laughs> Awesome. I bet we will. I feel like they're pretty on board. Uh, I'm going to submit some panel ideas as well. Um, and between now and then, if anyone has any requests on like specific research, like how do you research this topic? Tell me in advance, and I will happily prepare like specific topic specific things for the pre VidCon thing. And I will like, yeah, go all out. Awesome. 
And you're oh. welcome, Maya. Thanks for watching. <laughs> and they can be any length, too. Like, you could have something that's 10 minutes. Well, not any length. Let's say 10 minutes to an hour. Those are those are what we're going for. So if you have something shorter, like um, Roving Naturalist had icebreakers and stuff. So. so thank you guys so much for hanging out. Thank you, chat. You have Thanks, wonderful questions and insights. And uh, the next one we're going to do is uh, talking about scripts. So we'll see you guys for that one. Mm -hmm. Thanks, y'all. Bye.